Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest. He's a repeat guest. He's none other than Mr. George Ross. George is a true expert in the world of real estate investing. At 94 years of age, happy birthday, George. He's one of the wisest men I know. He's famous for his role as executive vice president of the Trump Organization for many years. The author of two best-selling books on real estate and negotiation and taught at the law school at NYU for over 20 years. Today's conversation is a little bit of a blue sky, crystal ball conversation about how to deal with uncertainty in the world of real estate investing. Listen to my conversation with George Ross. Welcome, George. Good to see you. Likewise. Before we start, I know you've got a a big birthday coming up because they're all big birthdays. I've not had it. It's already passed. Oh, is it? Well, thank you. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was uh, It was earlier this month. Yeah. Yeah, January 6th. That's right. I had it the same day as the, the resurrection, the insurrection, call it what you like. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Why don't we jump right in? Married for how long, George? Uh, 70 years. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. We're just thrilled to have you here again, George. Good. Glad to be here. Okay. Well, why don't we start a, a big issue that not a lot of people are paying attention to. And that is, of course, that the price of energy is just going through the roof. It's affecting many people all over the world. It's maybe not as much of an issue here in North America. At least it's not making headlines. But everything that we do is energy, whether it's putting fuel in your car, heating your home, food on the table, fertilizers produced by energy. And energy costs are absolutely going through the roof. So really, the question is, how do we as real estate investors underwrite in an era where if you if you were to price natural gas, as if it was a barrel of oil, it would price today close to $200 a barrel, if you know, in terms of equivalent energy, oils at over $85 a barrel, it's going to break 100 by most accounts. Over the next little while, some are even saying that it'll hit $150 a barrel. If you're underwriting real estate projects going forward, or even looking at reserves for your existing projects, what would you do to factor that in? In answer to that, uh, you know, this is one of the crystal ball questions yes. that I get occasionally. And I don't know the crystal ball. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I wouldn't factor it in at all. Somehow, prices, people... Of, of, of real estate, rents and everything else have kept up with whatever happened, inflation or what ha- whatever it is. Somehow people have need a place to live. They have to rent out the space. They have to get a job. The employers will have to pay a little more, but somehow it, it works out. And, and uh, still you have an economy which would be, which is, which is fairly strong. So I don't, I'm not a, a fan of speculation. Uh, I've seen too many times people speculate, well, business is going to go down, business is going to go up, real estate is going to go up, real estate is going to go down. And they're so busy looking to figure out what may happen that they are not taking advantage of what is happening. So I just, you know, I I can understand the concern, but what what are you going to do about it? Nothing. So then why get concerned? It's not something that's affecting my portfolio any longer. I mean, at one time, I, I owned a portfolio of properties in the Chicago market. And one of the artifacts in that market in particular, in that uh, segment of the market, is we often uh, included heat and cooking gas as part of the rent. Make sure they got to eliminate that. Absolutely. You've got to eliminate that. That's good. They let the, ten- let the tenants pay for their own. Because what happens if the, if, the own, if the landlord pays for it, they don't care how much they use. Exactly. Why should they? Somebody else is paying for it. So I would definitely uh, subscribe to the fact that you ought to have each of the tenants or the occupants pay their own way when it comes to utilities, be it heat, be it water, whatever, let them pay their own. And that way they will conserve it or they uh, they have to pay for it. So that's a good way to slow down energy is just make it more expensive so that people are concerned and they won't use it. If they can pass the cost off to somebody else, of course, why not? Who cares? Yeah, absolutely. So w- you wouldn't put any additional provisions in your underwriting just to, to buffer things for that? What, 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 when you say put, put provisions, what provisions? It's all you're guessing. Yeah. You're guessing at this point. You're guessing things are going to go up or down. No. I, if there is a way of, uh, of thinking and operating on a long-term basis as against a short-term basis, yeah, I would go long-term. 
I've always said, and I would tell all the people that are listening in now when it comes to borrowing, borrow as much as you can for as long as you can, as long as you have a right to prepay. If, the, if interest rates go up, you thumb your nose at the lenders. If interest rates go down, you refinance and get a better deal. And I, I think that, that philosophy has held, it certainly held well for me. And I guess, I think for most, most of the investors, it, it's done very well too. The, on the real estate, which I have interests in, the residential is, is going wild. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's in midtown Manhattan. And if everybody said, well, Manhattan is changing, it's going up, but there's whatever it is. At this, but I find now that there's a uh, lateral movement. Somebody that can afford three thousand dollars a month for a unit will still pay three thousand, but they get a better unit. Mm. In other words, they now get a five thousand dollar unit for three thousand dollars, or they'll get be, get some kind of bargains uh, if they look around. Maybe they'll get some free rent, or they get some utilities, uh, so, something, some incentive. It's given by the landlord in order to make the tenants uh, come. But I don't see uh, that generally in most of the areas, with the exception of the big cities, big cities have a problem. Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, all going to have problems. Because why? Because the not it's not the economy which is changing. It's the the people. They're losing the middle class. Right. And the middle class is, hey, I can... I can buy a hundred thousand dollar house in one area, and it's it's only really fifty fifty thousand. But that hundred thousand is four hundred thousand in a better area. They they'd rather rather say I, I can get more bang for my buck by moving. That's a trend. So what you're part part of what you're describing is a little bit of trickle down economics, which says okay, if I want to be in Midtown Manhattan, I'm going to get out of the fifty year old building that I'm in, and I'm going to get. Uh, a brand new condo for the same price. And so the vacancy is going to go to the junk in the market. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it, you can, it, somehow it, it's res, real estate has been resilient. And if you look over, over the last period of years, it's been, it's been re, pretty resilient. I mean, there are, yeah, there, there are places where they're overbuilt, over speculated. They built on spec and then the market wasn't there. Uh, it, when the time came to deliver, it just wasn't, but generally speaking, the, the real estate, especially uh, real estate uh, in a residential area, in a up and going uh, college area, also where, uh, where there are now some big companies which are building huge plants in areas and the workforce is there. Yes. Now, I'm not talking about plants. I'm talking about distribution of commodities. So they think it is like Amazon and, uh, and all of these other companies, they're inundated with, with orders and their warehousing. So what you have is you have a, a streamlining of the process of, of operating a business, and that's good. So will they operate with less people? Probably. Will they operate with more machinery? Probably. But, you're, but this is capitalism. Find out how to make more money spending less dollars on the production. And, and the entrepreneurs uh, that, that are aware of it are, are concerned about that and say, okay, how do I get a better workforce? And maybe I don't have, maybe they don't have to come in six days a week. Maybe I don't need a big office. Maybe I can, how much can I do virtual? Maybe I tap another, another uh, resource of uh, uh, women that's staying at home that don't don't want to go to an office or can't go to an office, and I'll use them somehow in uh, in, in my eliminating uh, the need for, for for workers. So it's a change. The change is taking place, and I think that the smart pe- the smart people are going to be successful. The ones that are aware of the change and will adapt it. Maybe the change is a four day week. Maybe the change is three and a half days. I don't. I don't. You you don't have to pay full time employees. No. But the employees have to go along with it. So now you may find a situation where if you don't have that, you, you don't have a job with a with number of hours, you get two jobs, half and half. So it's it's adapting to a changing environment that I think was is important and will be successful. This is not something which is going to take place in a, in a week or a month or a, a few months. It's going on now, and the executives that are running businesses are aware of it and saying, well, I have to do something different. How do I keep my employees? 
I don't know if you noticed, but one of the things is that a new employee, if you hired a new employee, you you paid them money if they want if they would quit. All right. Pay them money if they would quit. Where did you ever see that? That's true. And they're saying, well, yeah, but I want to know if that if you're going to stay, you're going to stay on a full-time basis. You're going to be concerned with my my business operation. And I want an agreement from you, you'll stay. If you're not going to stay, I'll pay you to get out of here now. Because I don't want to hire somebody and in two years have to train somebody else for the same job. So it's a it's a different workplace. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the examples that I think is uh, present in a lot of people's minds in terms of workforce migration, uh, perhaps Austin, Texas would be top of the list. Maybe second would be Huntsville, Alabama. You've got Toyota, you've got Mazda, uh, all of these auto manufacturers, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And then you have a, you have a, a an idiot situation where uh, they wouldn't wouldn't uh, let Amazon build a two million, two million square foot warehouse in, in, in New York. I, mean, I don't understand that. You have to... Go out and solicit businesses, which the a lot of the communities are. Austin is a perfect is a is a great example that, uh, of a of a community that wants to uh, attract businesses, and they are. So, when the first move went to Plano, Texas, everybody said, "Where is Plano?" You know. <laughs> I love my conversations with George. He brings such wisdom and perspective in dealing with navigating uncertain times, and we certainly are living in uncertain times. His message is simple. Uncertainty is a fact of life. you got to deal with it and make the best of it. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.